Uh, with regard to the structure of tonight, we, we have two short presentations, and, and we, we really decide to keep them very short because we want inter interaction with, uh, with our panel people and with you as the audience. But we thought it is good to have uh, two short presentations to stay away a little bit from the yes-no answer, uh, to have a little bit more uh, nuance in the discussion. So, and just to introduce the people that are going to be in the panel tonight, we have, of course, Nora Volkov. She's the director of uh, the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse in Washington. And she just got a, a doctor honoris causa at the University of our university, the University of Amsterdam. Uh, then we have uh, Mark Lewis, who is a professor or an emeritus professor uh, in the University of Nijmegen uh, and in Toronto. Uh, then we have uh, Reinhard Wies, which I think most people know. He's a professor of uh, developmental psychology or psychopathology in the University of Amsterdam. We have uh, Michiel uh, uh, van der Wolf, and he's uh, a legal expert, and uh, I've seen him in many discussions now, and it's, uh, there's a lot to learn from that perspective, and uh, so we're very happy that he was willing to come all the way from uh, from it. And then we have uh, Yolanda Bastians, and she is the, uh, the chief editor of, uh, of LEF, our all well-known uh, uh, magazine for uh, recovering in, uh, in addiction. So we're very happy with the panel. And we're also very happy, or I'm very happy, that uh, my boss, Damian Denis, is, uh, is willing to, to moderate the, uh, the discussion. So that's the problem. Let's start very quickly. Let's start with the first presentation. I think, uh, Nora, you're the first one. So I'm very happy, and uh, without... <laughs> and say that we know when I'm going to stand up here and say, no, you know, addiction is really a moral failure. The person just actually, when you take a drug, you feel high and goes, you know, there are certain people that love that so much that they take it in a way and it's a choice behavior. And <coughs> a heart that is being imaged based on the consumption of glucose by the tissue. When your heart is working properly, it's contracting, so it uses a lot of glucose. <coughs> So this is a normal heart, and it's just a muscle. It's extraordinarily simple. I mean, I think that one of the things as a medical student I found extraordinary was how easy and simple it was to understand the heart. And then, yes, if you do have a myocardial infarction, you can use this technology to identify the area on the heart where the, it's no longer using glucose. This is radioactive glucose, so you can mark it. Because the tissue is not contracting, so it's not utilizing it. And the cardiologist can use this image to document that, in fact, the patient had a myocardial <coughs> infarct, and second, also to identify where it was. Exactly the same technology can now be applied to the brain. But instead of looking at where the, the, the location is in the heart, you can look in the brain. And what you can see there is that you can consistently see certain areas of the brain that are important for uh, that are key components of networks involved with self-control, self-control, self-regulation, motivation, reward. And this is illustrated in these images here. Exactly the same technology. This is the brain of a normal person. This is the brain of a cocaine abuser. And you can see, just as I mark here on the arrow, the area that has decreased glucose consumption that shows the pathology in the heart. This is the area that shows the decrease in glucose consumption that shows the pathology in this case in a person that is addicted to cocaine. And similar findings are observed in other types of addiction. So the abnormality is that decreasing function of the orbital frontal cortex is not unique to cocaine addiction, but it's in general a pathology that we are observing with a wide variety of uh, different types of addictions. It is important because in this area of the brain, I mean, that's the other beauty about the imaging technology, that it gets you insight in terms of what are the consequences of having an area of the brain that is not working properly. So you start to investigate what does that brain area do. And that brain area, what it does, it basically assigns value to stimuli in the environment. So if I'm very hungry, food is extraordinarily valuable. But as I eat and as I get satiated, that food is no longer valuable. And that shift on the value that I assign to that particular stimuli allows me to be able to change my behavior. 
The moment that food is no longer salient to me, the orbital frontal cortex signals that because it's satiated and it turn, turns its attention to something else. And that gives me the flexibility to change the, my behavior as a function of the context. If I damage this area of the brain, which we can do in animal models by actually lesioning it, uh, or you study cases, neurological cases, where you can have head trauma, what you generate is a pattern that is very reminiscent to what you see in some of the symptoms of people that are addicted. They basically consume the drug uh, compulsively. There's no satiety. And this compulsive repetition of the behavior becomes very inflexible. So there are not other stimuli that can change the behavior of the individual. And that is, at the essence, one of the classical characteristics of the problem of addiction, that you have a disruption on the function of the orbital frontal cortex that is necessary for us to be able to have the flexibility of changing our behavior as a function of the context, and therefore maximize our motivation and our drive to what makes the most sense. And that is disrupted. That's one of the areas that's disrupted in addiction. What else do we know? Well, not all of the drugs that actually people consume, there are very few drugs that produce addiction. And we do know that all of the drugs that produce addiction actually have a common pharmacological effect. They increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and by so doing it, they activate it. And the nucleus accumbens is the main reward center in the brain, and reward is linked with motivation. So our biology has basically ensured that we will do behaviors that are indispensable for survival, by creating, by hardwiring those behaviors with a reward, with a pleasurable sensation. But the key component of this pleasurable sensation is not per se only the pleasure, but when this signal is activated in a way that is very strong or intense, then you actually generate a memory, a conditioned response. And these memories are actually not even necessarily conscious, but they are memories that drive behaviors. And it's exactly what uh, Pavlov showed in the animal models with conditioning of, dog, of dogs to, to a sound when they presented the food. They would salivate, that's conditioning. He didn't have uh, imaging, so he couldn't look inside the brain, but that is associated, now we know, from multiple studies by, done by multiple laboratories, that that's associated with a very high spike in dopamine into this nucleus accumbens. So here we have the normal behaviors, is the way that we get basically uh, driven and, uh, in order to do the behaviors that are necessary to have sex. We're, sex will require these reward associated signals, we require the signaling from dopamine. But all of the drugs which basically have hijacked the system do it in ways that are much higher, much, much more potent than those of natural rewards, whether it's sex or whether it's food or whether it's water, when you, are, when you, are, when you have basically dying of thirst. That produces a very high speed on dopamine, but never as strong as those that you see with drugs. And it is now understood that these supraphysiological changes, when you do it repeatedly, in individuals that may be vulnerable, triggers the adaptations that ultimately result in the loss of control and the compulsive patterns that we observe in addiction. So with imaging, we now actually can go ahead and look at actually these changes in dopamine. And based on that, we can actually document, well, if you are producing these very large changes in dopamine, what we do know in biology is biology likes homeostasis. We like to keep signaling physiological processes within a given window. So when you generate a supraphysiological process, what you do is you actually uh, adapt to it to try to bring it to, a, to the threshold that is acceptable. So we know from multiple studies in animals that when you do hyperstimulation of dopamine, one of the phenomena that has happened is to decrease the number of receptors. And this is a means to attenuate that signal because once dopamine is liberated, the way that that signal is transferred to the next station is via these receptors. And on the opposite, if you destroy dopamine terminals, what happens is these receptors go up to try to compensate. So we have these mechanisms that biologically are trying to maintain homeostasis. So now we know that when people or animals, whether it's rats or monkeys or humans, when you actually have individuals that uh, consume uh, ex uh, repeatedly high content of drugs of abuse, you downregulate these receptors, these dopamine receptors. And this, again, is not something that is specific to one type of drug. We see it in a cocaine abusers. This is comparison on the level of receptors, control, cocaine abuser, methamphetamine abuser, alcohol, alcoholic, 
uh, heroin abuser, uh, sm cigarette smokers also have this decline in dopamine D2 receptors. And the dopamine D2 receptors are uh, basically uh, proteins that are signaling in the striatal system, the signaling dopamine in the striatal system to modulate and regulate uh, uh, processes that are associated, whether it is with movement or whether it is with reward. So it's, they are fundamental in our ability to exert self-regulation. And, and we have been very interested in understanding how the receptors are actually able and engaging. What is, why is it that going up or down on your receptors has such a profound effect in, in the vulnerability to addiction? So here we have these individuals with very low levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And in animal models, what we can show, because we cannot do this in humans, but if someone were to ask me what would I like to see in order for, to treat addiction, I would say something that allows us to bring this dopamine D2 receptors elevated. And in animal models, we can do it. We can make an animal addicted, and then we can do a gene therapy to increase their levels of dopamine D2 receptors, and that decreases the compulsive administration of drugs, whether it is cocaine or alcohol. Those are the two drugs where that has been demonstrated. And we now know from our studies and from many others that actually this, uh, this, this propensity to be uh, compulsive, to lose control, when you have low levels of dopamine D2 receptors, that you see here in methamphetamine abusers, alcoholics, cocaine abusers, is in fact associated with these decreases in brain glucose metabolism in the orbital frontal cortex that I showed you to start with. So the reduction in dopamine D2 receptors is associated, this is metabolism in that brain region for different types of addiction, the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the activity of this brain region that I showed you. It's very important. It gives us the flexibility to regulate our actions as a function of the context and the environment that we are, uh, they are we're living on. And this is the data just in the animal model to show how when we increase the levels of dopamine D2 receptors by injecting with an adenovirus stereotactically that D2 receptor gene into the nucleus accumbens, you increase the levels of dopamine D2 receptor. This is day four, six, eight. It starts to go down. It's very short lasting. We can inject again. Receptors go up. And this is drinking behavior, changing drinking behavior. It dramatically reduces. It basically interferes. When you bring those receptors up, it basically interferes the compulsive uh, presentation of the behavior. So whether it is cocaine, the animals will consume much less cocaine when you increase those levels of receptors. Whether it is um, alcohol, they also will consume less number, uh, much less alcohol. So we know that, yes, there are significant biochemical and functional changes in the brain of individuals that are addicted to drugs that can be recreated in animal models. But we also know another extraordinary important aspect of addiction, and we don't need to neglect this because if we neglect it, we'll never solve the problem <coughs> of addiction. And that is that while drugs are very important in producing the changes that I actually mentioned to you that ultimately can result in addiction, by themselves, they are not necessarily sufficient. And there are multiple factors that contribute to the, 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 the changes that are produced by drugs into the brain. So there is an interaction effect. And those interactions, we know some of them are genetics. We've come to realize now for many, many years from epidemiological studies that gen the addiction runs in families. And so even if you are brought up, uh, if your parents are biological parents, are alcoholics, and you are reared by someone else, you still have the very same high risk of being an alcoholic as if you had been reared by your own parents biological parents who are alcoholic. So we know that genetics are very important. We can generate animal models. We can genetically breed animals to have a very, very high <coughs> genetic vulnerability for addiction. And this is important because we want to <coughs> understand which are the genes that make you more vulnerable. We also know that the, the developmental stage at which you start to take drugs also is very important in determining your risk for addiction. The younger you initiate drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, are smoking marijuana, the greater the risk that you will become addicted. And then extraordinary important is the environment. And this has, of course, captured and captivated the, the, the cold field, because we know that social stressors, that uh, environments where there is deprivation, environments where there is uh, physical abuse, environments where there is neglect of children, increase the risk and the vulnerability for addiction. And that's actually a studies that have been done now for many, many years, replicated. And so the question that we now have in our hands with these imaging technologies is the ability to inquire, how does the environment, why does, what does the adverse environment do to the human brain that makes it vulnerable? 
So now we can start to investigate how do genes influence our response to the environment? Uh, how do genes influence our response to an adverse environment? Versus how do genes can provide resilience, right? And how then those genes and the environment interact on, on determining how the drugs are ultimately going to affect, affect our brain. And it is these interactions of the multiple factors that are ultimately necessary in order to provide a much more comprehensive understanding about uh, why some people become addicted to drugs and why some people do not. But more importantly, what are the environments that can provide resilience? What are the factors that can make a person much more likely to not become addicted? This is a beautiful study that was done by Michael Nader addressing the issue of how adverse social environments can actually negatively influence the brain in ways that make you much more vulnerable to fall into those compulsive patterns of drug taking. So these were monkeys that had been reared in isolation all of their life, extraordinarily stressful for a primate. And in these animals, they measured the dopamine <coughs> to receptors, which are here. This is one animal, this is the other. And then when the animals were adults, they were brought into a group environment to form where they form a hierarchical structure. Some of them became dominant, some of them became um, subordinate. The dominant ones increased dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum. They went from a very stressful to a non-stressful state. To be a, a dominant in this type of primate is utterly non-stressful. You get priority for food, for females, for everything. Here, on the other hand, to be a subordinate is not. And that actually those animals that were subordinate remain with very low levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And as you may have predicted based on the data that I've shown before, is indeed when they put these animals to see if they self-administer uh, cocaine, they showed that these animals with high levels of dopamine D2 receptors did not administer cocaine, whereas the subordinates did. And these are different doses and there's an optimal dose that's favored. So overall, having high levels of dopamine D2 receptors appears to have a protective effect. And if you come from a socially stressed environment, that's very likely to actually downregulate dopamine D2 receptors. And I want to end up uh, the presentation by two more things, since Win is up here telling me that time has passed. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them, because they are uh, probably the most important components, addiction is a disease that in principle is fully preventable. And there's been an enormous amount of research that has been done to try to determine what are the evidence-based interventions that can prevent drug abuse. And there are basically multiple the interventions that go from in, in universal interventions that can be done at the population level and have a significant uh, effect in declining drug use. And then there are those that are tailored for those individuals that are higher risk that actually can decrease and provide resilience to those subjects. So basically it means decreased risk factors at multiple levels and increased protective factors. And then the last one is addiction can be treated. And I think, again, in, the, in terms of the concept, it can be treated in the terms that people can fully recover, and it also can be treated in the terms that the brain can recover. The important aspect of it is actually that uh, we, or people that could benefit from treatment, very few are getting access to treatment. And why is it that they are not getting access to treatment? One of the things is because it's highly stigmatized. Among other things, in many places, addiction is criminalized. The concept of addiction as a disease that can be treated, and it can be treated like any other medical disease, actually provides an infrastructure, the healthcare system, that can take responsibility for the screening and the treatment of those individuals. And of course, at the end of the day, it is society, the one that has the main responsibility to create the infrastructure that will allow us to prevent the occurrence of addiction. Because as I say, we know how to prevent addiction. We don't know how to prevent Alzheimer's disease that we do know how to prevent addiction, and yet we are not doing what is necessary in order to avoid, uh, as we are currently living in the United States, the devastating effects from that opioid crisis. Thanks very much. Um, so, yes, I do take a critical position toward the disease model, the famous disease model of addiction, and I'm going to explain why. Um, but we don't disagree about everything, that much is for sure. So I think that instead of thinking of addiction as a brain disease, we can see it as a habit of thinking, feeling, and acting, a, a cognitive and emotional habit, if you like. Obviously, it's a deep habit, it's a resilient habit, it's a hard habit to break. 
But the question is, is it different? Is a habit of the sort differ from other habits, normal habits? For one thing, it develops. I think Nora agrees with that. It develops along particular timelines for particular individuals, for particular factors that might differ between individuals. And it develops in response to social and emotional challenges. Well, why not call it a disease? And first of all, I want to mention that I think it's important. I don't think it's just semantics. Nora, I know you say this. You say, I don't care what you call it. But um, a lot of people in the world do care. And they care because it has, whether you call it addiction or disease or not, has implications for, uh, well, for treatment in particular, for how, how addicts feel about themselves, how their families feel about them, how society feels about them how people see themselves and how they see their futures and how they think about their capacities for growth and change. Especially because the disease model, at least until tonight, this is the first time I heard you say that, uh, for the last 25 years has defined addiction as a chronic disease, a chronic brain disease. And that makes a difference, I think, an important difference. Um, okay, premises of the disease model. I'll just go through them and say why I think they're uh, lacking. First, premise number one, brain change equals brain disease. Well, we saw a lot about brain change this evening, and I just want to say it's a lot more complicated than it looks. Of course, Nora, Nora said the same thing. It's particularly difficult because the dopamine system is so complex, and some of the dopamine comes from the drugs themselves, and in this case, we, Nora talks a lot about psychostimulants, cocaine and methamphetamine. Well, yes, they directly put more dopamine into the synapses, but other drugs, like heroin and alcohol, don't. They don't put dopamine directly in the synapses. Rather, the dopamine comes from other channels, which have to do with attraction and repetition and anticipation. That's different. <coughs> and dopamine has a lot of different functions in the brain, obviously, Nora knows this. So, brain change equals brain disease? No, I don't think so. And the, the other bigger factor is that uh, neuroscientists um, recognize, of course, that all learning involves brain change. And the more the learning is deep, repetitive, and has to do with strong emotional uh, targets <coughs> or goals or activities, the deeper the learning is going to be when it involves sex and survival and uh, love and strong passions and religion and things like that. The learning is deeper and harder to break. So brain change, yes. Brain disease, no, not necessarily. Second premise, and I'm talking about the, the premises that are normally associated with NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which of course Nora is the head of. Um, I should also mention that some of these arguments are not just my arguments. There's an awful lot of people who don't like the disease model, not just me. Uh, there's a society called the Addiction Theory Network, uh, with 100 scholars throughout Europe and North America, that basically think that that's the wrong way to talk about addiction. So. Um, yeah, it's not just me, but these are some of the, I think, standard arguments. Premise number two, drugs are what change the brain. This is what Nida has said for a long time. No, I don't think drugs are what change the brain at all. Because we see similar brain changes with gambling, with porn addiction, with sex addiction, with gaming addiction, with internet addiction, with binge eating disorders, with obesity. And Nora's done research in the last two as well, and found that changes to the orbital frontal cortex are also uh, Easy to see with people who eat too much. So it's not about drugs. Maybe it's just about addiction. Okay, so then the next premise, brain change in addiction is unique. That might be the next argument. Brain change in addiction is different. No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is unique. The brain changes that we see in addiction, for example, changes in the sensitivity of dopamine receptors, which Nora talked about, sensitivity or density of, nor of dopamine receptors in the striatum nucleus accumbens or orbital frontal cortex. Those regions happen when people are very involved and very committed to sports, either as doers or as watchers. Um, wealth acquisition, uh, politics, credit card shopping, shopping in general, love and sex, religious experience, you get a dopamine rush before you see God, also there's research on that. Um, and, you know, just imagine if you're quite an extreme religious uh, um, believer, a jihadist for example, then 
I imagine that would be a hard habit to break. It would also involve a great deal of change to the, uh, to the motivational systems of the brain. But the point here is that these are all activities that are repeated, that are highly emotionally involving, highly rewarding in some fashion or other, and therefore they would be most expected to change the brain, especially involving the dopamine system. And indeed, there's lots of research to suggest that they do. And by the way, everything changes the brain. As I mentioned before, in fact, psychotherapy changes the brain in very significant ways. Meditation changes the brain in very significant ways. So we have to be careful when we talk about brain change. Premise number four, addiction is chronic. Well, I heard Nora say tonight that people recover, and yes, I think we agree, people recover. But it's been the position of NIDA for a long time that addiction is a chronic disease. No, I don't think it is. Most people recover. And this is not just a few, and it's not just in relation to treatment. Most people recover without formal treatment. Okay, now this is not widely known in some circles. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but the research is very clear. The majority of addicts to any substance and to the behavioral addictions will quit within a certain time frame. And in fact, Gene Heyman is one person who's identified the mean, the average, or the median time frames for quitting different substances. For cocaine, it's four years. For cannabis, it's six years. For alcohol, it's 12 to 15 years. These are averages or medians, actually. For tobacco, it's a whopping 25 to 30 years. So tobacco is indeed a very dangerous drug. Um, but you see, these facts are available, and we are able to collect them and able to develop mathematical models based on these, these times, times to quit. And the fact that people quit often without formal treatment, this is something from, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Inside Rehab, Anne Fletcher. She says that most people, when they get in touch with a rehab center to quit their addiction, most of them quit before they get there. <laughs> she, she has a lot of research in this area, and I think that's just a fascinating little factoid. So it has something to do, obviously, with motivation and intention, not necessarily with what you're getting from the treatment center. And, in fact, with real diseases, with medical diseases, the opposite is true. Most diseases get worse with time if they are untreated. They don't get better. So it doesn't seem to me like addiction is properly classed as a disease in the sense of a medical disease, despite the fact that it does change the brain. No, I don't think addiction destroys the will at all. First of all, I think we have to um, remember that acquiring illegal drugs takes a fantastic amount of will, effort, and cognitive skill. Uh, especially when they're illegal, hard to get, and expensive. I know, I was an addict so in my 20s for about five years. I did a lot of illegal drugs, or did drugs illegally. It, uh, doing it and then stopping it takes a lot of work and a lot of concentration, a lot of focus, and a lot of willpower. Um, and also, I think we should be aware, because free will is a very dodgy concept. Will is not simple. In neuroscience and cognitive science, we've known for many years that the brain seems to make choices without us. Huh? So that the brain, does, research shows that people will choose whether to press the right button or the left button before they're conscious of making the choice. In other words, something in their conditioning or the preconditioning, precursor, stimuli, cues, context, etc., will determine that choice. But so should we say they have no will? I don't think so. Will is much more mysterious and slippery than that. I was uh, driving my son Julian to his dance lesson yesterday, and I came to a, a stoplight in Arnhem, where I live. So it's a very, uh, very irritating stoplight because it turns orange every three cars. And you light up for a long time, and it turns green, and then boom, it's orange again. So as I approached the orange light, I had to decide: should I, you know, be like a North American and just pull it, just pull it on through, or should I be a proper Dutch person and stop? Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I don't know how I made that choice. Do you know, I mean, sometimes you probably do one and sometimes you probably do the other, and I don't think you know how you make that choice because it's very complicated. It has to do with a lot of things that you are not presently consciously aware of. It doesn't mean that you do not have access to will. The other really important point is that willpower itself is the only way to overcome addiction. So since most people recover, which uh, you know, is if most people recover and it takes will to recover, then obviously will must have been present there in the system for them to do that. And it's really that simple. 
Okay, so here is a billboard on the side of a highway in the US. Addiction is not a choice, it's a disease. I'm sure there are a lot of billboards like that in the US. It's a very, uh, I don't know, what should I say, dramatic, dripping uh, proposition. It's one or the other. It's either a choice or it's a disease. It's complete dichotomous, completely binary, there's no gradations, there's nothing in between. And there are those happy addicts that are very happy because they're not going to be blamed for their addiction because they have a disease, so it's not their fault, right? Well, that just doesn't seem like quite the right idea because the dichotomy is wrong. It isn't the case that if you don't have a disease, then you are evil and immoral, okay? It's not the case that if you don't have a choice, <laughs> then that's the end of the story. And it isn't the case that if you choose to take dangerous drugs, you are, we, we understand that the disease model came along the, heel, the heel, heels of a, of a previous disposition towards addicts through most of the 20th century that saw addicts as being immoral, as being, uh, having something wrong with their character, with their personality, being sinful, being evil, being self-indulgent self or what have you. And the disease model comes along and says, no, it's not, they, we shouldn't blame them, we shouldn't punish them, we shouldn't throw them in jail and isolate them. And that's absolutely correct. That's compassionate, it's well-founded, it's well-intended, and I, I admire that. However, we can go further. We don't have to stop there. We don't have to go back to the moral model. Rather, we should go forward and see what else is available. So imagine the addict coming in for treatment. What do we say to this, this poor person? You have a chronic disease that you will never be free of. Well, that's the old story. Maybe it's possible to recover, but generally, chronic relapsing brain disease, it's there on the NIDA website. You have a chronic disease that you'll never be free of, you've lost all control, and therefore you can't be blamed for your actions. People won't stigmatize you for being immoral, well, that's a good thing, but they will stigmatize you as someone with a mental illness, forever different from normal people. There's been a great deal written about that, about the impact of biogenetic statements on people with psychiatric problems. It's not necessarily a nice thing to feel that you have a disease or you know, a, a intrinsic difficulty problem that will never go away that makes you different from everybody else. You don't necessarily want to sit down at that person's table if you're in a crowded restaurant. So that's another kind of stigma, and it's serious. And finally, um, because you have a disease, you must seek treatment from medical authorities because, you, okay, you must seek treatment from medical authorities, even though doctors don't actually treat addiction. And I think that's an important point to make and we should come back to it in the debate. Doctors do a lot of great things. I like doctors, my brother's a doctor, um, my father was a doctor, but they don't really have the tools for treating addiction. They can prescribe methadone or buprenorphine, suboxone to people who are addicted to opioids. That's one drug out of many. But for other drugs that don't cause chemical dependencies, there's not a great deal that they can do. And notice that a lot of the columns that you put for uh, treatment and prevention were all socio-emotional, uh, socio psychological things that had to do with support, community support, family support, uh, laws, policies, and so on and so forth. There's nothing medical about any of those things. Those are the things that can help people in addiction not necessarily doctors, and because it's just not what doctors are for. It's not what they do. So, in my books, in my talks, my articles, I try to understand how people become addicted. I tried to I wrote a book on how I became addicted. I wrote another book about how other people became addicted through a lot of interviews, very in-depth interviews with people. That's okay. Um, and how they grow beyond addiction, how they got past it. Okay, how I got past it, how they got past it. And I've talked with thousands of people who've lived through addiction, but I am still very interested in their brains. And it irritates me, probably just as much as it irritates you, Nora, maybe even more, the people who oppose the disease model say, well, let's forget about the brain then. If we don't like the brain disease model of addiction, then we have to leave the brain out of it because that's reductionist, you know. It's reductionist, so let's not go there. No, wrong. The brain is really important. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's combine neural findings with other forms of data. And I would suggest three basic uh, pillars here. First, neuroscientific findings, thanks to NIDA and the scientists there, and the energy and the funding that have come from NIDA for years, changes in dopamine circuitry, reduction in 
prefrontal activation, all the other stuff that Nora talked about. That's one pillar. Two, developmental psychology. Let's understand how children develop. Study normative stages of development, especially because addiction has to do with age. People get addicted in adolescence, yeah? Mostly in late adolescence. And then look at individual pathways of development. Look at precursors of problems. Look at predictors. Look at outcomes. This information is available. And thirdly, lived experience. <laughs> Nasty. Don't you hate PowerPoint sometimes? I, I, had a, I put that in this very loose um, handwriting type script. And as soon as I did that, everything else in the whole presentation turned into handwriting script. So I methodically went through all my slides and changed them back. And now that one's changed too. <laughs> that was supposed to be like a letter that some kid wrote to his or in a diary or something. The next time my parents kicked me out of the house, I wanted to show them how bad I could really be. The point is, if you're studying addiction in a lab or through a scanner, you probably don't have a lot of opportunity to talk with addicts. And it's not your fault, you're, there's a lot to keep you busy. But it's very important to collect these stories. It's very important to listen to addicts, the experience of becoming addicted, the environmental and social and emotional and familial pressures that go on inside and outside the individual. You have to understand these things, and the only way to understand them is through... Okay, so I'm going to, you're going to give me one last minute, right, to finish. Okay. Um, well, I guess I won't have time to read you my letter, but look, conclusions. <laughs> Severe addiction, I think, is like a disease in many ways. The idea that addicts need help, not punishment, has been championed by Dr. Volko and Nida, but neurobiological change does not equal pathology, that is not necessarily true. We must use insights from neurobiology to help understand developmental processes that lead to negative outcomes. We must also pay attention to social processes, and if I can have 15 more seconds, okay. I, I often think that, okay, 20 seconds, I often think there are so many social problems that we deal with in a very fundamental and, and, and uh, energetic way without ever calling them diseases. Racism, bullying, domestic violence, poor parenting, teen pregnancy, loneliness, crucial problems that cause a great deal of suffering. We don't have to call them diseases in order to try to help. All of these things depend on particular cognitive habits, poor emotion regulation, unfounded beliefs, and truly brain changes as well. And the kinds of things that we do to help people that have problems are community resources, counseling and therapy, social support, and education, which actually Nora put in her list as well. So we don't need the disease concept, and in fact, it may, it may obscure and obstruct our tendency to think about these responses to serious personal and social problems. Damian, it's a simple task for you to yeah. moderate. You. Uh, so there is some stance that you see how you are going to use it. I have it already. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I'm very honored to do this, um, particularly with. Uh, so thank you, Wim, for organizing this, and I would like to thank the speakers, and of course this interesting question, probably one of the most challenging questions in neuroscience: Is addiction? A brain disorder or a disorder whatsoever. So I would like to ask uh, Nora and Mark to sit down over here um, and then the panel as well. Uh, Reinhardt, Yolanda and Hugh, you can sit over here. And Wim, you would like to, would you like to join? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna sit over there? Okay, yeah. Okay, Nora, first of all, I would, um, he was the second speaker. Um, could you comment a little bit? What do you think? Do you agree with Mark? Well, I think that, I mean, I agree with you that brain change does not mean uh, disease because the brain is constantly changing. It's one of the most dynamic networks that there is. So I think that what we have to do is we can take the terms to the extreme and negate any communication. But and that's why I say the word, what does disease mean? Disease is a state where the function of the organ is resultant in pathology and negative outcomes. So for example, and there are many factors that are in that respect are very similar to other diseases, like the fact that we do interventions that are social to prevent disease of addiction, uh, is the same sort of thing with diabetes and metabolic syndrome. The prevention of these diseases actually entails these educational changes. 
And social factors are fundamental in a lot of the outcomes. And unfortunately, whether it is cancer or hypertension or um, diabetes, the outcomes are much worse than those that come from uh, socially deprived environments. So social concomitants of disease are recognized and known for many, many years. And I, and I think that the notion is at what point do you call the, the, the way that an organ is functioning so I can have my heart and it may be changing and its contraction is not perfect, but I still okay. So there is a point but where I cannot... Just come back to the, 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 I mean, his statement because is it a habit or is it a disease? Did to make it very simple? No, I, I would call it a disease because it basically has negative consequences for the life of the individual. If it's a habit that actually optimizes my performance, like my habits of washing my teeth, it has no negative consequences. So the term of disease connotes that negative outcome for the individual. Okay, thank you. Just one small remark and then we go to the panel. Mark, you can comment on her comment? Sure. Um, there are lots of bad habits in the world. Yep. Habits don't have to be positive. Skydiving is probably dangerous. Uh, unsafe sex probably leads to negative outcomes. So I don't think the negativity of the outcome determines whether we call it a habit or a disease. I think we need to know whether the brain changes that happen in addiction are fundamentally different from the brain changes that happen when people are going crazy watching a football game or being jihadists or in some other way being terribly excited about some repetitive activity that they engage in. Okay, I go to the panel, you can, you can talk, yeah. yeah okay. no, not, well, so you are going to tell them... I'm going to the panel now and then you get yeah. another opportunity. I just wonder, I mean, here in the audience, how many people consider themselves addicted? Could you raise your hands? Okay. Is that a majority? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Shall we start with the? You're the legal person. I mean, that's, that's your. That's a reductionist view. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's true. I have to keep things simple here. Okay. We have two statements. We have the disease model, the habit model. Of course, it's much more complicated. We all agree with that. But could you just can you give us some comments? Both presentations, and could you do you prefer someone, Mark or uh, maybe at the end of my reaction? I would okay, say, start with the explanation, yeah. and then okay, go ahead. Well, I guess the question to me is, uh, does it matter uh, what the model is of addiction when it comes to certain legal questions uh, related to addiction and law? Uh, doesn't have one discipline. For example, we have civil law, criminal law. And I know in civil law, at least in the Netherlands, uh, the disease model is accepted. For example, when it comes to the question, can we uh, commit someone against his will into a mental hospital or a treatment facility? Then it can be considered legal insanity if it is associated with uh, risky behavior to others or to self. And, and I think that would be also my question to Mark, whether in his developmental model, because um, I think you, you may not recognize uh, that uh, there is a group of addicts that may need coercion to overcome their, uh, their habit. Um, would you uh, agree on that, that, that they could be coerced and then it becomes legally relevant? Okay. Is that a clear? Yeah. Is it yep. clear for everyone? So the disease model helps you as a legal person to force exactly. patients helping them with the problem. Okay. Exactly. Well, of course, coercion is often involved. Obviously. I mean, the U.S. is full of people in jail. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, the U.S. is full of people in jail because of their drug taking. Well, that's obviously a form of coercion, and there are drug courts, and there are also psychological reinforcement contingency paradigms for helping addicts quit. So, yeah, coercion works for anything, for anybody, from worms to, to humans. I, I'm not sure that I see the point of that. So, if I have a disease like tuberculosis, I don't think coercion is going to have too much impact on whether or not, or how I get better, or, or diabetes, or um, whatever else it might be, malaria or anything else, and that's the whole point, is that coercion is a psychological process, at least when it comes to humans, and therefore the fact that it, it is 
uh, significant for people who take illegal drugs, I think argues against the disease model. Because I actually, it's interesting that you're asking that. I mean, one of the things that we're observing, for example, in with the opioid crisis, is that we're having individuals coming with overdoses into the emergency room, and they are reverted and they are saved, and then they are basically released into the street. Then they overdose and they die. So one of the concepts is: Do you have, as a physician, the position to put someone against their will, so that you can admit them to the hospital and protecting them from overdoses? And this is actually something that the states are starting to discuss because the mortality rate is so so high that if you don't do it, the likelihood that they will overdose is extraordinarily high. So, and, and in that in that case, the model of utilizing what we do in psychiatry to put someone against their will if they don't want to stay in the hospital does save you some time to try to stabilize a patient. They agree with each other. The disease model is not uh, 30, uh, 20 second response. The overdose crisis is mainly driven by fentanyl, which is used to lace heroin, a product which is 10 to 50 times more powerful than heroin and much cheaper to make. People take heroin laced with fentanyl because they're not given other opioids that they might like, need, or want from the medical community. And that is very unfortunate. Okay. But it doesn't have to do with the nature of addiction, per se. Well, uh, no, no, just a moment, just a moment. I just give the, the word to my legal person. There's so many like durities. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> would, you, would you like to comment on both of them? Uh, is it helpful it's, what they said? Or? It's actually what I figured from their... Okay, you, uh, you knew... If, you, if, yeah. you view, if you see it as an, uh, a disease, then you would say treatment is the answer and coercion could be helpful. If you do not see it as a disease, then uh, why need treatment and why need coercion to help the treatment? So that's what I, what I figured. But maybe, maybe it's interesting to turn to uh, criminal law, because I think uh, we're two steps behind there. We, I don't think we accept the disease model or the developmental model uh, of addiction in criminal law. We are still stuck in the immoral or uh, sin model when it comes to to crime. Yeah, and I, be, go ahead. Shall I explain? Shall I explain? <laughs> yeah, no, and, I, and, and that's why. And I mean, I'm glad that we are bringing this up because one of the problems that we have faced in the United States is the criminalization of the person that's addicted. And you showed you, I showed you this data with the primates. What happens to you when you are in isolation? So when you put someone in prison, it's probably one of the most socially stressful things that you can do an individual. How does your brain react? That's going to lead to a down-regulation of the dopamine D2 receptors, which you require in order to self-regulate. You're not choosing to self-regulate. You may call it whatever you want, but you, have, you are deteriorating the capacity to actually, for the person, to be able to do the right choices. So putting someone in jail only does not work, but it actually increases the risk of that individual to actually fall into these compulsive patterns of behavior. Okay, Mark, you would like to comment on that one? I totally or? agree. Okay. So, wow, thank you. Do you have some, something else to, some, or another remark from a legal perspective? Yes, because uh, I think we all recognize that uh, it is not good to be in jail, uh, for, uh, for, not for your health or for overcoming any uh, social problem. So uh, we try and fix things within jail, but it's, it's really, uh, really tough. But what you uh, might expect, if you would accept the disease model, for example, we have something like, which is called the insanity defense, or in Dutch, ontoerkeningsvatbaarheid, within uh, criminal law. And it's actually a legal tradition, it's a universal legal tradition, I would say it's a, it's a moral tradition. It's, it's even observed by uh, Frans de Waal, the famous primatologist with him in monkeys. So I guess it's even broader than just this human morality, that if someone uh, acts uh, because of uh, a mental disorder, then he should not be uh, punished. And actually, I have never heard uh, of any jurisdiction in the world uh, which has not punished someone from being, uh, for being addicted. So I don't think that anywhere in the world in criminal law uh, the disease model is, is, is adopted uh, when it comes to legal insanity or the insanity <coughs> defense. So it doesn't work? Even if there is a disease model, it doesn't work? Well, I've tried to think about why, why that is. And if you go back to ancient Roman law, which tries to explain why we have this moral tradition, 
it is said that you don't have to be punished because you are already punished by the misfortune of your fate. Hmm. And I think there may be, that may be crucial because uh, do we view it as fate, as something like a mental disorder which can accidentally happen to you? I, I think uh, most people, and uh, I'm also a judge at the Criminal Court of Amsterdam, most of my colleague judges uh, will not view it as fate, but as something uh, blameworthy because you did something wrong in the first place, mm -hmm. maybe 20 years ago, uh, and you kept doing it, and maybe now you can't help yourself, but uh, it's that in, in legal terms that is called prior fault, the blame is still attached to your earlier behavior. But is fate not an old word for brains? Uh, you tell me. Well, fate or in the Roman Empire, brains now in Nora Volkov's empire? Being determined. <laughs> yeah, no, what I was making me think is because I've been approached by many lawyers with that question, would I be interested in testifying for someone because of their addiction? And I basically refuse. And I think that an important component in it has again with the notion if you do have a disease, it is your responsibility to actually take care of it. So if, for example, I have severe seizures, it is my responsibility not to drive. Because if I drive and I have a seizure, I'm going to kill someone else. So I think that the notion of where you put the context of each individual in terms of what they can do to avoid an adverse circumstance is something that goes side by side for, for any of the diseases. And in this case, in addiction, you know that when you are in an environment that is harmful, you are actually taking drugs. You may do things that otherwise you wouldn't have done. And so, so you do have a responsibility there. That's very different from someone that is fully psychotic, fully paranoid, and kills someone in that context. Because they don't have a way of understanding that that was going to happen in that, in that circumstance. So I think that there is a distinction between these two types of, of uh, mental illnesses. Okay, thank you. We go, we're going to move to an illegal person, a psychologist. <laughs> Reynolds? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, well, first, um, I also uh, thank you for inviting me here on stage with two people I highly admire. Um, Nora for uh, bringing a lot of knowledge on what changes in the brain when it comes to addiction. <coughs> and Mark for really putting a lot of critical questions on whether these changes mean that it's a disease, and particularly, and that's I think the most interesting part here, the question of whether it's a chronic brain disease, because that was the earliest statement, and indeed I was also pleasantly surprised by the ending of uh, Nora's speech. Um, I am um, a, in agreement with Nora that one of the most interesting things, but also, um, well, really one of the core features, and I think Mark is also in agreement with that, is this loss of willpower, or whatever we want to call it, free will, difficult question. Um, but the original idea of the chronic brain disease would be that you completely lose it. That would be the, like, the extreme position where there is no more willpower and the drug is all dominant. And I think that position is probably untrue for the large majority of cases. So you could think of cases where this might be the case, but in most cases it will not be correct. Um, a little sidestep to our dog. We have a dog, and when we go eating, we put the dog in the bench, because we don't like the dog when we're eating. So every night we put this little biscuit, a dark biscuit, well we actually only have to say we're going to eat and he's already, he's very Pavlovian, <laughs> waiting in front of the bench for this little cookie. He gets the very small cookie, he's happy in the bench, we start eating and after like five minutes he's howling for the rest of the meal. For seven years he never thought of for saying this small reward for the later problem of howling for <laughs> half an hour. And that is, I think, the extreme case. Now, if we translate this to addiction, this is not the case. And Carl Hart has done interesting research with heavily addicted people, giving them these direct choices, where people could get directly 
their favorite drug, even illegal drugs, or a relatively small amount of money, most people choose the money. So it's not like they are without a choice there. But as you get more addicted, your choices get biased. So I think it's really a more gradual perspective. So it's not black and white, and actually, with a philosopher, Ted Fenton, who's also in the audience, we wrote a paper in reaction to Mark Lewis saying that it's not the black and white, but more shades of grey. Um, yeah, original titles all over the place. Yes. Anyway, so there is, the one thing is, what is the scientific status? Is there some, maybe some, t would you like yeah. to comment on this one, the, the concept of free will and the claim, when you're saying yeah, that it's more, I mean, it's more sophisticated, it's not black and white, and even in very severe cases, there's always the free will. So, a responsibility in a way, in that case, it's not just, there is some culpability and some responsibility. You know, and I, I mean, I think one of the things that we were discussing it earlier today, that we try to do as a therapeutic intervention in people that are addicted, is to help them recognize on what environment they will be able to lose the control of their drug intake. So I can tell a very severely addicted cocaine abuser, I want you to inhibit the craving when I show you that cue. And they are able to do it, provided that I actually am I, I'm preparing them for that. On the other hand, if there is an unexpected intervention, or if there is a very stressful setup, then that gets disrupted. And I think that in, that is where you lose the flexibility and the resilience to respond to an environment in the optimal position. And disease, at the end of the day, is the loss of that resiliency. To the extent that we are less able to adapt to more complex environments, we become more and more vulnerable. And in addiction, you are losing that. And yes, you have an extraordinary capacity to prepare your day about where you're going to get the drug without anybody finding you, and you can be very, very precise. But it is for that specific task. And so you, your universe is becoming narrower and narrower. And that's where you see the evolution of, of the disease as it goes along. OK. Mark, you would like to comment on the yeah, I, um, I understand what you mean about the loss of flexibility. Of course I do. Uh, it's extremely common for humans to have competing goals. In fact, it's very rare not to have competing goals. Anyway, um, the, the point is that yes, we should and need, we should have and we need flexibility to choose among competing goals. And it's true that with addiction, we often lose some of that flexibility. Well, we also lose flexibility for choice when we are, I think many people who are intensely religious are not terribly flexible when it comes to matters of the universe, cosmology, and nature. Parents are not very flexible when it comes to their children or other, uh, they're obviously the most important people in the world and that's that. Anyone who is strongly committed to a particular immediate goal, which is salient and, 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 and hugely important to them is going to lose flexibility in terms of their capacity to think away from that goal. Okay, so There's yeah. also the temporal issue with the dog and delay discounting, but we can get into that. Right. So not typical for addiction, that's what you say. I mean, normal the loss, people are as the well loss flexible. Of, fle loss of flexibility with addiction can be understood because it's an extremely important, extremely present goal. Also, it's a known goal. I know if I take this stuff, I'm going to feel different. Okay. And if I don't take it, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel. So that also adds to the particular, that choice bias. Bernard? Yep. Um, so the first part is about what it means in science and where we are. And I would argue, you know, a disease, you could call it a disease, but I think the crucial part here is that you can recover from a disease. So I'm really happy about the chronic part being left. And I want to briefly mention a paper I did uh, that Corinda Veers did, and that's my cousin who happens to work with Nora. Um, yeah, we have this gene for addiction research for some reason, independently going to addiction research. Anyway, so she compared heavy smokers with people who never smoked. A lot of studies have done that. And you see a lot of, say, cure reactivity, approach bias, automatically triggered approach bias in the smokers, which you don't see the people who never smoke. So clearly something has changed in the brain and it's probably related to their smoking. Interestingly, she also found people who had been abstinent for five years from smoking, so ex-smokers. What was their scores? Completely like the never, score, the never smokers. 
So the idea that it's a chronic brain disease that you can never recover from is clearly not true for everyone. Of course, these were highly successful absent people and most smokers, at least in some cases, do recover. So this very study could not exclude the possibility that for some people it might be more of a chronic change which always makes them vulnerable for smoking, but clearly not for everyone. You want to comment? Yeah, uh, I want to comment because I showed uh, data in that, and that's an old paper, and we re replicated it recently. And those are methamphetamine abusers. And what happened was they were on the, they, they were in a criminal, so they were on one of these. Whether if they take drugs, they would go back into prison. Um, within that context, we had a pretty good <coughs> ability of the individuals to stop taking drugs. They were on treatment for one year, but what happened was those were 30 percent of the patients. 70% of them relapse, and we could not do the, the study. So this reflects a subgroup of the individuals that were able to be successful <coughs> in stopping taking the drugs, and the brain was a, able to recover. And so we've been trying to determine the extent, because there's tremendous variability. In some individuals, you see the recovery of the brain changes, and in others, not. And in animal models, the same thing. And so in an animal model, you can look at uh, you know, the excitatory response, the neuroplasticity changes, that enhance the signaling to the glutamatergic DNMDA receptor that is associated with the enhanced sensitivity to the cues. That can be very long lasting. So that's why we call it a chronic model. That mean, but that does not mean that every single individual follows one path, like any other disease. There are individuals that recover spontaneously and others do not. So therapeutically, what do we tell to people that are addicted to drugs? we do not know the extent to which they are vulnerable. And we all know the story of people that have been in recovery for 10 years, something <coughs> stressful happens to them, they relapse. And, and when they relapse, the consequences can be very, very negative. So I think that the understanding the diversity of the trajectories is like any other disease, something that could account why some people recover and others do not. But, oh, but you mean that the vulnerability is chronic? Once well, that, you have been addicted, there's always risk, risk, even if you recover, of becoming addicted again. Is that what you claim? Or? Well, that is therapeutically, in general, the safest way to address the concept that if you have been addicted in the past, I do not know if everything has recovered mm -hmm. completely. So my advice is, uh, is avoid yes. taking the drug because you do not know and you don't want to have a relapse. So I am being conservative as a therapist to try to prevent that person from relapsing. But it is possible that some people have recovered completely. But in animal models, and this has been shown uh, mostly in rodents, you can have them uh, withdrawn from the drug for many, many, many months. Then you put them in an environment where they condition and they immediately relapse. Okay. And so it's six months later and they relapse. So the changes are still there. And that's why the concept of this being a chronic disease and how long it takes you for you to be able to recover depends not just on the drug but also on your own genetics as well as the chronicity whether how long have you been taking that drug okay thank you a small comment ran out and then I yeah so basically i think we agree here that in some cases um, extreme cases you can talk about a chronic brain disease but in most cases well, it may depend on the drug, <coughs> on the person, there can be actually recovery. Final point I want to make, and it's actually relating to the treatment part, and that is also something that Mark touched upon. The term brain disease is not neutral. And already in the 1980s here, uh, one of our colleagues, I can now say, uh, the late Joop van der Plicht, did studies in heavy smokers, and he found that people who believed it was a habit had actually more success in quitting <coughs> than people who thought it was a chronic disease and an addiction. And I think Miller has shown similar studies for alcoholism. So it's not a neutral thing. And the, so for the patients, it might actually in some ways take away their hope if there's this chronic brain disease. On the other hand, for the public, it can help against stigmatization. Wim van der Brink here led the heroin trial, and I think without something like a disease model, that would never have been accepted. <coughs> Interestingly, some of the patients in the heroin trial, so they did better on heroin than on methadone, 
recovered. So first they were selected because they had this chronic brain disease, and then a small minority of them, because all the stress of taking the illegal drugs was taken away, they recover. So there's also so there's some relativity to the brain yeah. disease model. So it has but it's two no implications. Neutral. It may be helpful, but as well destructive in a way, because patients are less motivated. For the therapeutic <gasps> part. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the things that I, and I'm glad you're bringing upon this because it's something that has been very difficult in the whole field of addiction. I think that many patients that are on recovery don't dare to speak up and set up as an example. So if others don't see that you can completely recover, then the notion of having a disease that you're never going to be able to lead a normal life becomes stigmatizing in itself. So we need to actually, one of the things that I've been very, very appreciative is of individuals, families who are willing to stand up and say, I had an addiction and look how I reintegrated my life. Because we need to provide those examples. We do it for other conditions. And that will change that very negative that there's no solution. I don't want anyone to know. So is the real problem, has this maybe something to do with the way we perceive or see a disease, a disorder? Maybe it's, it has nothing to do with addiction, but the way we, I mean, deal with a disorder in our society. It is, it is. And, and whether it is cancer, whether it is cancer or whether it is schizophrenia, I mean, there are different degrees, but of all of that diseases, addiction is probably the most stigmatized, but in general, there is a stigma for disease because it means something that is not completely perfect and we're in a society where we adore perfection. And so that's where, and then we need to change that and that's again where the perspective of by speaking up about the contributions and the ability of people to actually integrate and the fact that it's so very common. How many people don't know of us or have a family family member that's addicted that that's what's creating compassion and the empathy. And that will change, but it okay. is... Uh, it is Mark, would you, could you comment on that? Yeah, many points of agreement, but I don't think any of them rely on the disease notion. Yes, some it's wonderful for people to stand up and recognize their problems and admit them and try to deal with them. Did you want to say goodnight to Nora? Or is this, I think so. Is She's this the leaving. Uh, what's going on? Nora, are you leaving us without saying goodbye? No. Yes, she's feeling me. Ah. I am going to say, so to say goodbye. I'm sorry. I have to leave because it's actually, I'm actually, uh, I arrived yesterday and I'm leaving tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the morning. But it is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Wynne for having invited me and for giving me the opportunity to be here. And I guess I need my, in my last words, I think that. At the end of the day, what we, what we can do that can make the greatest impact is actually agree in terms of what is it that we're going to do as a society to change what we are doing to prevent and treat uh, addiction so that we don't see the devastation that we're currently seeing in the United States. And it's not just in the United States, now it's emerging in, in Canada, and that's for the opioids. And in the meantime, we also know the devastating consequences that both alcohol and tobacco play. So I think that understanding better, coming to an agreement about what are the resources, bringing forth the, the importance of, of this condition, whether, I mean, or this disease, and uh, so that we can put the, 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 the infrastructure necessary to solve it. That's what I would like to, to hope that I hope that we do in this debate actually uh, come to recognize that we cannot keep ignoring addiction, hoping that it will go away by itself, that it does require investment on resources, both for the prevention and the treatment. Thank you. Yolanda, sorry, I say Yolanda, sorry. Yolanda, okay. Um, what are your thoughts? You, you see it from a different angle still? From a, I mean... Uh, I think so. Well, first of all, I'm not like, a scientist, of course, obviously. I am a journalist, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm used to ask the questions instead of giving the answers. Um, so I will, I have a question for you, and, and the, the, we talked about it a, a little bit earlier. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak to each other uh, a long time ago. Uh, why is it that you are so afraid of the word illness? 
or disease. And, and um, let me explain that a bit. We, we work with a small group of journalists at uh, Left Magazine. And we all have this thing. We work with, with two alcoholics in recovery. Uh, we work with someone with Addison disease. We work with someone who has a chronic liver disease. Not one of the alcoholics, by the way. <laughs> and we all are happy, well-functioning, normal people. We never take a day off. We, 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 I think, I think we need role models. That's, I, I think our perceptive of, of, of sick, of, of illness is very important here. It's, it's, uh, how many normal people do we know? Can, can I ask the audience a question? How many addicts here call themselves uh, uh, having a disease instead of a bad habit? And then, I mean, the other way around, how yeah. many... How many people are addicts and have a bad habit? Do not habit? like, uh, yeah. yeah, dislike the term. Yes or no. <laughs> so how many people with addictions um, dislike the concept of disorder? Do Think not they like have a disease. Have, yeah. <laughs> that was the first one. That was the the first disease. Question. Who has a disease here? Who is an addict and has a disease? And who doesn't have a disease even though they have an addiction? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you better see a doctor. So maybe it's time to maybe we can ask someone from the audience. So who wants to who sorry? I can understand that. Okay. Maybe we could... Some of the... the yeah, but can comment on your question. Okay. Yes? Please, and I want to ask it to, to Mark as well. Why, why is he so afraid of the word disease? A quick answer. I, I'm not afraid of it. I just think that there... Throw the... I think that it has disadvantages for many people. And I've talked about those. And, um, however, if somebody thinks of themselves as having an illness, that that's the way they... they understand their alcoholism or their addiction, that's okay, I don't want to take that away from them. I mean, we all have different, and sometimes very idiosyncratic ways of understanding and defining ourselves, conceptualizing who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. Fine, okay, go ahead. <laughs> it doesn't work for me, and I know that there are a lot of other people for whom it doesn't work, because it oversimplifies a very complex issue and creates a particular kind of stigma and pessimism and sometimes hopelessness that for some people can be quite deadly. So I think it can actually go either way. Is there something else that you would like to comment on? Because now you, I mean, it's from the pers personal perspective that you wonder whether it's... No, 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 no. Dr. Lewis said we, we talk to thousands of addicts, so, so do we, yeah. in Holland and, mm -hmm. and, and abroad as well. And, and we, are, we hear different things. And I think it's important, uh, whether you call it a disease or not, where, how do you feel in recovery, but, um, yeah, well, so thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. So we heard from somebody who said they did, I think, feel they had an illness, but no longer. To, and that's, that's also, you know, fine too. That's, that's another okay. way of understanding oneself. Wow, we agree. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yudi, would you like to, I mean, um, <laughs> throw that dice in the, in the audience? Are there some people with questions? Urgent questions for one of the panel members or Mark regarding the topic that we discussed. Yeah. And the black thing on top, that's the mic. Hello? Yeah, that's the yeah. Um, I have a question to uh, Mark. Could you just maybe introduce yourself? A uh, I'm yeah. Ted. Uh, I'm the philosopher who wrote a paper with Reinhardt once. Um, and I wonder why talk about the habit system? Because a habit is a... Why talk about the habit system? Uh, because a habit is a response to a stimulus, but as you've mentioned um, in drug addicts, they go through kind of complex processes to uh, attain a certain drug. So why talk about habits, not about desires, or whatever? Yeah, that's my question. I see. I see. Um, 
Pavlovian habits, stimulus response habits, are a particular kind of habit. So Pavlov's dog hears the bell and salivates, right? And mother might hear their child cry and immediately become distressed, even though nothing might be wrong. So that's, that's called stimulus response learning. That's one kind of habit. It's very automatic, and it's mediated by the dorsal striatum, not by the nucleus accumbens. It doesn't, there's many other kinds of habits. And for example, we have operant behaviors, which are in behavioral in behavior theory, um, behaviors are reinforced, are rewarded. Well, most of what we do consciously, we do in order to get reinforcement, in order to get rewards. I'm talking right now because I think, I don't know, that I'm going to make sense and people will admire me. Well, that's a reward. I'm not talking as a stimulus response. So, and yet, I do a lot of talking, especially in this sort of context, and that's a habit for me. It's just not a simple habit. So I think your notion of habit is much too specific. I think complex behavioral habits that fit into particular social uh, contexts are very common. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Here from, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. My name is Anke and I work in Eastern Europe and Central Asia in the former Soviet Union. And there is um, a major HIV uh, crisis going on, especially on people who use drugs. Um, and um, once um, the government decided that drug use was a disease, uh, the drug users were able to access services for HIV and also to access services for uh, clean needles and, and syringes. So it was actually a very pragmatic approach and, and it helped uh, a lot of people to prevent diseases like HIV and also viral hepatitis. Um, is that um, an approach that you would support? So do you think that we should all adopt Soviet-style governing and uh, policing? I think the States, the United States did it as well. No, the problem is, if, yeah, particular societies and groups and socio-political entities have particular ways of dealing with addiction. Sometimes they're humanistic and well-founded, sometimes they're stupid. The war on drugs in the U.S. has been a colossal failure. Everybody knows that in the addiction field. A colossal failure. Now, if, if suddenly, you know, a, a Putin or the last Tsar uh, decides to call it a disease and therefore you have access to either bread or um, medication, okay, fine. That's just a maneuver. It has nothing to do with the actual essence of the problem. It doesn't help define it. It doesn't it's help a, make it's sense. It's a trick. It's a trick. A societal trick to get people into treatment. Unfortunately, it's happening in the U.S. also. And obviously, that's where I'm most concerned. You, you say, I have a disease. You raise your hand. It's not my choice. It's not my fault. Harvey Weinstein's done that about his, his issues. And uh, you know, and then you sign in at the rehab. And if your insurance happens to cover it, then you might get treatment that works, although your odds are about 5 to 1 against mm -hmm. okay. it working. Any one of the panel members uh, acting? Um, it's a little bit like uh, the AA model, eh? so many of you know AA, and it works for some people. And of course they always had this very strong claim that you're always addicted. And that is, the, in a way, the current chronic brain disease, as it's still on the NIDA website, is a kind of biological variety of that statement. Now, whether that's true or not is one question. Of course, if people believe this and help, it helps them to stay away from the drugs, it's probably helpful. It was not more helpful than other interventions like cognitive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing, big studies show. We can't also predict for whom which therapy works best. Basically, after a year, half of all the people have relapsed in that treatment studies. But, you know. It might be a story that is helpful for some people, but it might also be detrimental for other people who lose their hope uh, because they have this chronic brain disease. So I think we should really distinguish, say, what is the truth in science, and of course in science we're always looking for the truth, and on the other hand, what does it do to patients and to society? And as I mentioned earlier, there might be positive and negative effects. For example, with the heroin addicts the trial, I think that's a very positive thing, like a spin-off. But it, for individuals, it could also have negative effects. If for people who want to quit smoking, it's actually better to believe that it's a habit you can quit. Mm -hmm. Because then you can quit. 
or at least it increases your chances, well, it increases your chances to remain abstinent. Okay, someone else? Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Bedin Pedali. I'm a civil worker and uh, uh, specialized in debt counseling. I find your ideas very uh, interesting. and I agree that uh, habits or addiction is deeply ingrained habit forming. It's not as trivial as I uh, think many people think of it. Um, what I find very interesting is that there has been a lot of uh, research by the University of the Hochschule of Utrecht in people with debts. The, uh, and they found that there is this addictive behavior. Often people who are uh, raised in families where there are many debts, they develop the same problems. And I think that corresponds very much with what you have been saying. However, there is a lot of resistance to this idea. Do you think that it has to do with the, how do you say, the, the the tendency in society nowadays to medicalize things, to have a pill or a diagnosis for ADHD or say, oh, it's a medical thing, we'll give you a pill or a treatment and then we don't have to think about our, all the other sociological problems in society that use this habit forming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, habits are terrible things. I mean, they are. I mean, most of the bad things we do are habitual. We yell at our kids or beat the dog or, you know, whatever you do, or drive too fast or drive drunk, whatever it is. These are habits, and habits can be nasty. They're not trivial at all. But what you're saying about, yes, in families where there has been adversity, difficulty, uh, well, there, there's a very well-known study, the ACE study, an Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which shows strong correlations between adversity in childhood and adolescence, and that includes uh, parental mental illness, parental separation, abuse, neglect, various kinds of abuse, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Those people are more likely to become addicted. Well, now we're talking about complex socio uh, social factors, social familial factors. Who can go in there and fix those things? How incredibly expensive and far-seeing and far-reaching would that be to go in there and try to help families that are vulnerable? Tremendously expensive, incredibly complex and frankly impossible in this profit-driven society. So what do we do? We call it a disease and we say, here you can go to the doctor, you can get this pill. Well, you've got 10 minutes with the doctor, so what else can they do but give you a pill, right? And that's generally the solution. The bigger problem, not only is that unfortunately rather ineffective for the addict, him or herself, but also we have a society that is essentially bearing a problem underneath medical terminology. A whole lot of problems that are social, that are complex, social, familial problems that we can understand as such are instead uh, provided with a terminology, a basket, a wastebasket really. It's a disease and therefore you take a pill, you see the doctor every three months and that's that. And then we don't have to worry about that anymore and I can run for re-election. But just to, to comment on that, for example, when I think about Amy Weimhaus, I mean, thinking about her with, I mean, that she died because of a bad habit sounds a little bit weird to me. I mean, she died and obviously she lost control in a way, which is much more, uh, which was much more um, determined than just having a habit, you know. Sure, but let's separate the, the components. She might have also driven her car after not getting enough sleep after several concerts and gone off the road and died that way by losing control. So we have to separate that. Secondly, people who die from addiction, so to speak, are not necessarily dying from addiction. They may, die, may be dying from depression. Very often, addiction and suicide are linked. But that doesn't mean that addiction causes suicide. What is more likely is that the depression causes the suicide, and the addiction may actually delay the suicide or other very unfortunate uh, outcomes because, mm -hmm. let's face it, when you take certain drugs and opiates make you feel better, guess what? And so do antidepressants, although not quite as effectively. So people take drugs to feel better and the nasty things that happen in people's lives often happen when they try to stop. Okay. These are but in a complex situation. In her case, it isn't possible that she was completely incapable of changing her behavior. Who says? I don't know, it's just a question. 
In that case, would it be justified to call it a disorder? How would we ever know that someone's incapable or just didn't change? How would we ever know? What would the audience think? Yeah, just... We speak about... Uh, a question for you. We speak about uh, habits. Is, is a bad habit, is that a disease? Not for me, no. Okay. <laughs> That's easy. But that was the question, yes. But we, uh, in the game, we are asked not to say with yes or no. So maybe you can explain a little bit deeper about my question. Very likely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, win? Yeah. First the lady and then win. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, first the lady and then win. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I work as a nurse for the Jelinek. Um, I have a lot of patients and I did a presentation on, on uh, craving and I uh, used a lot of information from your book, uh, Mark Lewis. <laughs> and I really um, think or believe that it's just not so easy to define because it's a bigger thing. It's all. It's like we have a lot of psychiatric uh, um, patients with an addiction, and it's not so easy to say it's this or it's that or it's a disease. It's much, much bigger than that. That's what I wanted to uh, say. Okay, thank you. I, I actually agree with you. I think this <laughs> issue of which basket to throw it in, this one or that one, is a bit misleading. Uh, I think addiction is incredibly complex. So when people ask me, what, what do you think addiction is if it's not a disease? Sometimes I want to answer, what do you think sex is? <laughs> what is it? Is it a this or is it a that? Is it an A, a B, or a C? There are some things that are so complex and so fundamental that they do not fit categories. There is no category that it fits inside of. So why don't we call addiction a very natural process with many complexities that many people fall prey to for a whole variety of reasons that have a particular shape and a certain set of probable outcomes and then other less probable outcomes. And all those complexities, we can say that's part of the phenomenon and it doesn't nicely fit any particular category. If you could throw it to win. Yeah. Oh, very well done. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I saw your interaction. I, I, for the first time, I, I saw Damian like, but now we're having a serious case. We have something like a disease. And I also thought when you were have this interaction like he could talk to you about obsessive compulsive disorders or maybe depression is it a disease uh, like obsessive compulsive disorders these compulsions they look very much like habits they're very close to it extreme habits that make these people's life i shouldn't talk about you can say how miserable these lives can be up to the level that they come for brain surgery they have no disease they're People with a habit, and come on, don't complain. And you, Damian, you're actually maltreating these people with these unfortunate habits. Sure, I'm putting electrodes in human brains yeah. because of their bad habits. Bad habits. <laughs> but they're pleased with it. But nobody can say they can. But as very few people complain about it. When it comes to addiction, suddenly it seems there is something special. I, I remember the the nice paper that David Nutt wrote about what he called equity. And uh, actually, it's, it's uh, what it is, it's actually recreational horse riding. And then he compares the brain damage due to recreational horse riding and ecstasy. And he says, actually, recreational horse riding is much more dangerous for the brain than ecstasy. <laughs> but still, we talk differently about what is good and bad when it comes to drugs. So. You have the same problem with Damian's idea about OCD as being a disease that he's treating, among others, among psychological treatment, also with medication and with the brain stimulation? Or is it only when drugs get involved? No. I don't think I have a problem with it. <laughs> um, no, we don't have a problem. Deep brain stimulation, I find it quite fascinating. I'm actually going to write a novel about that. <laughs> um, we do things for people to help them, whether it's psychotherapy, counseling, support, a slap on the back, a hug, or whether it's education, a teacher, a guide, a mentor, a meditation teacher. We do whatever we can do to help people suffer less. 
I don't see that there's a line in the sand past which it's called a disease and before which it's not. But then there are no diseases anymore, at least no psychiatric diseases? Well, as Nora said, there are things like Alzheimer's disease where we see a very particular physiological process which is obviously unnatural. That's different. I have no problem calling Alzheimer's a disease or Korsakoff syndrome, which you might get with too much alcohol, a disease because it has to do with a particular vitamin deficiency and basically loss of brain cells. That's different. Okay, I can call those things a disease, but OCD, it's, it's, it's a problematic thinking style. Yes, it's serious. Yes, it causes suffering. I, I don't see the advantage of calling it a disease myself. Okay, so you need a, a pathological substance. To, you need to see something before you consider it being a dis disorder or a disease. Pretty much. But that's a very old-fashioned opinion. I mean, going back to the 19th century, because there are a lot of things that we can't see in the brain. I'm a very old structure. person. Sorry? A very old yeah. person. <laughs> <laughs> Any one of the panel members wanting to comment on that? Well, maybe a, a parallel to the criminal justice system. Uh, I've worked at a facility where we treat, so to say, criminal behavior. In a way, it also hinders uh, to uh, motivation for change. Uh, if you, it's, it's very hard to say, first, you are not responsible in a way, but now you need to take responsibility for change and, and, and for uh, a new life. And uh, my personal observation, but there, there have been some, uh, some uh, writings on it as well, is that it, it taking responsibility away hinders change in a, in a way. And it may be that calling it a disease may help accept it, but may also hinder um, changing the behavior. But I don't know whether you see that. Okay, it's both sides, yeah. yeah. No, you agree with that, okay. We have another question. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Derek Lois, TU Delft. Um, and so the idea is, is that um, while you may be schizophrenic and you may be schizophrenic, uh, if you have highly violent symptoms, that's almost a different disease. Um, and the whole notion of disease just kind of withers away because it's just a matter of what are the symptoms that you need help for. Uh, and so I, I wonder whether uh, the shift away from strict categories of disease in something like the DSM to more of a um, uh, system of uh, uh, matrix-based uh, uh, symptom clusters would be more appropriate for personal treatment. Um, yeah, good, good point. Did you know? Well, yeah, I think, yeah, or, or someone else, but you yeah. go ahead. Very, very good point. What we're talking about, I think, goes back to what someone said about what's going on in Russia. So the disease becomes a label or a card that uh, gives you access to treatment. And that's all it is. It's just a label that gives you access to treatment. So it gives you access to HIV treatment or something if you're, if you're in Russia. But there, it's kind of like signing a confession for a crime that you didn't do. I mean, it's, you do it because it gives you access to treatment. Well, unfortunately in the U.S., as I'm sure you know, treat, the whole treatment industry is driven by an insurance industry, which is entirely profit motivated, and therefore treatment is reduced to the smallest nutshell, the shortest possible interventions, because that's how you make the most money, okay? So the ticket for treatment that you get by calling something a disease may be itself counterproductive. I, I know a little bit about the, the matrix approach, the, the uh, correlation matrix approach, and I think it's really an interesting way to understand functionally how people are different psychiatrically, absolutely. But understanding something is one thing, and getting help might be another thing. Okay, someone else? Yeah, I agree. I think it's an interesting approach, and it shows a lot of overlap, like you have strong reward sensitivity, uh, lack of inhibition, but it also might point to these the individual differences which determine why some people, and uh, there's estimates like maybe 15% of the people who use a drug a lot really get addicted to it. So that's probably more related to individual person characteristics which put you at risk than to just the drug which is, you know, addicting you. So I think that is interesting. And there's another recent approach, the network approach, which is a little bit different, but it's because you mentioned symptoms also. 
and I think that is actually very therapeutically helpful also because it can show a bit like function analysis in the CBT what the triggers are so if your depression leads to recurrence of drug use then maybe do something about the depression etc etc thank you we still have time for some yeah fun question <coughs> last one thank you very much uh, my name is Maart I'm an editor at left magazine and I want to ask my was a question, so I have to be very careful uh, with that. Yes. Um, Something like that. Um, Could you speak in the microphone, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in what way did your uh, opinion about um, addiction being a brain disease or a disease uh, help you in your own recovery? Did that help? Um, actually, um Maybe a bit, maybe uh, because of the stigma, because the stigma is huge, let me tell you that. And only, my personal um, opinion is only when you're open and being, show the world that, that you are a healthy, nice person and that you have a nice life in recovery, uh, that helps. It's not only the brain, but I, I was wondering, uh, does our insurance in Holland pay for a bad habit? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, d I think, I think, no. For, 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 no, they good don't. Habit. No. Nothing. Then we call it a disease. Yeah. Then, then I have a disease. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of being a recovering addict. Thank you. Is there anyone who has a one? Yes. A question, an important question for the last few Yeah, over there. Okay. So that would be the most important question of tonight. Yeah. Uh, Pauline Decker, I'm a pulmonologist and I treat a lot of people with uh, tobacco addiction. And um, I'm currently filing a criminal lawsuit against the tobacco industry. One of the most important issues is uh, freedom of choice. That People say they have to smoke or not to smoke. And um, I would like your opinion on what to say um, to people who say, because there are people who can recover from this addiction, um, they state that as an argument for the freedom of choice. What would you say to people who state that? Do you, do you mean whether I think there should be freedom of choice to take things that are bad for you? Is that, is that what you mean? No, but, uh, no, no, that's I'm not sure question. I understand. Mm -hmm. um, there's an argument against the uh, addiction, be, uh, because people say, be, because people can recover from this addiction, it's still, it's a I freedom see. of choice. The activity itself yeah. is freedom of, of choice. Of course, chosen. the Dutch word for addiction is far better than it's the like English it. word, because we, we call it enslaved. People yeah. are enslaved. So you're asking whether I think that people still have freedom of choice when they're... Yes, when they're addicted. Addiction. Yeah, well, that's, I think, what we've been talking about for a lot tonight. And, and Nora puts that in terms of willpower, or will, free will. She calls it free will. We don't even know if there's such a thing as will, never mind whether it's free. Uh, and uh, I put it more in terms of competing choices. So I think that when you choose to take heroin because you're absolutely miserable and depressed and living alone and impoverished or in some other way uh, oppressed or marginalized and you take an opiate because it makes you feel better and you can get through the day. I think that could be not only a free choice, it could even be a good choice. I don't think anyone has the right to assign the goodness or possibility of choice to other people because we don't live their lives. Okay, so yes, I think that people, even though we say that they're addicted because they make the same choice over and over again and they don't seem to be able to make other choices or they don't make other choices, you know, uh, I just don't think that that means that they uh, have zero choice. I think that they still indeed do have choices and they might be making choices that are good, bad, or just maybe necessary. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
So having a free will, I would like to end this session and ask uh, Wim to come here for some final words. Uh, yeah, you're, you're forced to do that anyway. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and I would like to thank in the meantime the panel and Mark for their discussion and presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Damian. Uh, uh, as, as far as I've been following this discussion, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a, an issue that's resolved, and, and probably there's no way to find a, a final answer, because we're talking about models, and that is what we do. And we use models to exchange our thoughts about situations, and we also use models because we are engaging people with problems, and so we're looking for the best models to both have a good communication and to to resonate the problems that people experience and to see how we can best help them. And, and so in that search, I think we're somewhere, sometimes we are very oppositional and sometimes we are pretty close together. I think in the ultimate goal in, in providing uh, adequate uh, uh, approaches, I'm not saying treatment because it's so medical, care and approaches, I think we, we, we have to find ways to do that in the best way and, and we will be different in that. And I remember so well when we did the heroin trial in the Netherlands that I had some fights with people from the, uh, the abstinence movement and I think at the end, let's not do that. There are different ways to, to recovery and so we're using different models for that and at the end, the only way to reach most people is actually by being flexible in using different models for different people in different situations. So that's, that's definitely, I think, the most important. And I think that we've seen a little bit of that. And so we ask you to be opponents, and so we have magnified these differences, but I think there's much more, more overlap than that there's differences. Uh, it also struck me a little bit that it seems that we, we don't have discussions, whether that's good or not is another way. It's, uh, it's about some of our other mental diseases, disorders, mental conditions. And that is striking because is it the fact that there's drugs and our thinking about drugs, our moral thinking about drugs, our political thinking about drugs, that makes this such a specific discussion? Because I think as you indicated, and I think other people have indicated, there is no fundamental difference between some of the other mental problems that, that, we, that, that we engage. And so, so, to restrict it to addiction only, I think we have to realize that it that cannot be for nothing. It has to do with some idea about our society thoughts about uh, drugs versus other kinds of substances or other conditions. Uh, which means that that may also define what models are most useful in engaging with people because there is a context in which this all takes place. So this is a few things that actually I learned from this evening and so thank you very much for, for coming because I know that was actually quite short notice and it's wonderful that, uh, that you came with so many people. I think it's also because Nora Volkov was here addiction got a lot of attention in the academic community in Amsterdam and that maybe is the best thing that we start talking about it and that we have exchanges between professionals, scientists, patients, <coughs> users and so we need that interaction or Nora would say we need the interaction of the brains of people so <laughs> let's have more interaction of brains of people uh, uh, in the coming hour, we can stay here till 11 o'clock. If you want to drink something, you can still do it till 11 o'clock, but you have to pay yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.